almost all of you are involved in digital transformation. And I think you already realized that this task is very hard. And that's why you are here. You are looking for ways to make digital transformation easier. Um, I have bad news for you and good news for you. Bad news first, only few companies succeed. Digital transformation is very hard and it will remain hard. Otherwise, more companies would succeed with it. And then you likely wouldn't be here in this session. Welcome, welcome to Transformation Talks. I'm uh, Tairu Hassan, uh, the director of uh, Brightline at uh, Project Management Institute, PMI. And our talk today would be about transformation in action. And as we know, the global interconnectivity changes the way actually business works, especially when we talk about how value is created, how value is delivered, how it is captured. New technologies really not only offer innovations for new product or new ways of production, they also offer opportunities for organizations to bring their communication and cooperation skills to the next level. Uh, this shift is what we call basically digital transformation. But really, even though there are many years that have gone by, the implications for business are still largely underestimated. And today, we are really privileged to welcome Yanka Krins Klebe, uh, managing partner at Koshif, to share with us her insight and her perspective. Almost all of you are involved in digital transformation. And I think you already realized that this task is very hard. And that's why you are here. You are looking for ways to make digital transformation easier. Um, I have bad news for you and good news for you. Bad news first, only few companies succeed. Digital transformation is very hard and it will remain hard. Otherwise, more companies would succeed with it. And then you likely wouldn't be here in this session. The good news is digital transformation is possible if you don't shy away from the really hard work. And this includes work you might not even think about or work that you think is not that important. I'm here to show you this work. It will give you a higher chance of success in your digital transformation efforts. Without this, your digital transformation efforts are likely to fall short. For many years, I managed and coached several digital, digital transformation projects in large corporations and also in small and medium-sized enterprises. My observations of why digital transformation initiatives fail are in line with the findings of several studies done by McKinsey or Boston Consulting, KPMG and Bain and Company. The risk of failing with the digital transformation initiative lies somewhere between 70 and 95%. The main reasons are those on this slide. Let's start with the missing why. Often, even in the sea level, there is no shared understanding about why the transformation has to be done. Some time ago, I was joining a kickoff workshop for transformation initiative, and it turned out that the board members had all very different understanding of what their transformation should be all about. The missing vision is a problem I never see in owner-led companies. Other companies often have the problem that they stick to their existing business and refuse taking new risks by steering away from well-known path. Lack of understanding happens when you're just following the hype without an idea how to benefit from it. A narrow focus on technology and IT. Well, digital transformation comes with what digital in its name and is therefore see, seen as an IT topic. This completely misses the fact that companies are still run by humans and that they need to be in control of any technology. Leaving humans behind is a recipe for them not understanding 
or not making good use of all the shiny new technology? What leads us to the next shiny toy syndrome? And I think I don't need to go into details here. Sticking on outdated technology is the other extreme. The IT infrastructure needs to support old business operations as well as all the new business. This will likely require an update on the IT infrastructure. A recipe for failure is to stick with an aging infra infrastructure such as IT that is already discontinued by the vendor or will be in the near future. Transformation also often fails due to a lack of adequate enterprise governance. When governance and management practices are strictly centered on the dominant and most profitable business, they just limit the strategic options for new opportunities. Governance needs to provide incentives and room for risk taking and new management practices. This kind of governance is either already existing or it rarely has a chance of emerging. Sticking on established management practices is also one of the root causes for failed transformation attempts. These practices are good in optimizing resources for the main cash cows of a company and are good for businesses with a stable income stream. But these management practices are not suitable for innovation, quickly changing market needs, or dealing with new opportunities and threats. They are far too risk averse and slow to effectively deal with these challenges. They are unable to keep pace with innovative competitors and customers demanding better service. A narrow focus on digital business models means doing step three before step one by trying to create a digital business model without understanding what, it, what is necessary to, pro to profit from it. For example, a lot of German car manufacturers started mobility and car sharing services. But this was doomed from the beginning because they were not able to profitably process very high numbers of microtransactions, nor were they able to establish competitive service platforms that required compensating their inevitably high costs via very high numbers of transactions. This example shows that you need certain crucial abilities within your company to run a digital business model, if it shall ever become profitable. Of course, there are many more reasons why a digital transformation initiative falls short or even fails. But this overview give us, gives us a good impression that a transformation is way beyond adding some new tools or improving only small parts. To succeed, companies need to go all in, looking at the whole company and how each part is connected to the future. When we look at this recent study about the major challenges in digital transformation, technology doesn't seem to be a major challenge. Where companies struggle to make progress is the ability to adapt structures, processes, and organizational abilities towards new needs. And it is a whole company that is being affected by IoT business models or any other digital transformation effort. Business processes need to be adapted. People need to be trained. The efforts have to be staffed and need to be built up. They also need to be aligned to coexist and cooperate with the incumbent business. And all this, despite a general shortage of resources and long-standing internal competition between departments. This looks like a rather depressing situation, and for many managers it is. There is no quick silver bullet to make these challenges disappear. Managers need to acknowledge these challenges and systematically work on resolving them. This is where strong leadership comes in. Without strong leadership, none of these difficult challenges would be resolved. But strong leadership is not enough. 
leaders also need to understand the challenges in depth and have a clear frame of reference to guide their decisions in resolving them. I will try to provide some important parts of this frame of reference. But first things first, let's start with digitalization. Digitalization, frankly, means to implement and use state-of-the-art technology in business operations, getting rid of paperwork in operations, having the same data and work status available throughout operations, enabling all people to work with the same data and not separate copies to guide their work efforts. This requires a digital backbone for internal transactions and the sharing of data across departments in real time. Today, having such an end-to-end -end digital backbone is seen being mandatory for companies. It requires to remove cross-functional barriers in the value chain, including those in indirect functions, especially in approval, acceptance, and internal propagation of business orders. Yet, only few companies have achieved this digital backbone. The reality in most companies is still characterized by a plethora of media disruptions in the work stream, standalone applications, and inconsistent data. To put it plainly, digital is no longer optional. An end-to-end -end digital backbone is not something nice to have. It is a prerequisite. It is essential to have a business operating system on a state-of-the-art level. Otherwise, it is becoming the major roadblock as the company won't be fast and flexible enough to catch up with the competition. A study published in January 2020 by McKinsey and the World Economic Forum showed that only few companies have even taken the first step towards digitalization. More than 70% are stuck in the efficiency or technology trap. And they are just missing the boat when it comes to future business and establishing cross-company value chains. And it is even worse. A joint study of the German company Trumpf and the Fraunhofer IPA Institute showed that 80% of the improvement potential can be found in indirect processes. Here, an average productivity gain of 30% could be achieved with a comprehensive digital integration. A study done by the University of Munich in 2018 already indicated that German companies mainly focus on internal processes and adapting IT to new technologies for the existing business without jeopardizing or abandoning it through a major transformation. On the other hand, this study also indicated that executives see an urgent demand for a bigger change that includes rethinking organizational structures and collaboration, the need for change in corporate culture, and the need for new business models and competencies. Well, and these topics are exactly what a digital transformation is all about. So the hard work is yet to come. Digital transformation builds on achievements of digitalization and prepares a company for future business. Never underestimate what this means. A transformation will rock the very foundations of a business and permanently changes the way it thinks and acts. Preparing for future business means being able to quickly adapt to changing market environments and to quickly take advantage of emerging business opportunities. A successful digital transformation enables companies to connect to customers in new ways, to create, deliver, and capture value in new ways, to organize work and people in new ways. Therefore, transformation is not about building an innovation lab or an accelerator and hoping for it to create the next big innovation. Transformation is to rethink how business can be done in the future, utilizing the chances that come with new technologies and taking advantage of the interconnected world. This is a challenge, but also an opportunity for companies. 
Connectivity makes it easy to collect data about users and their behavior in order to gain more precise insights into their needs. To stay relevant in this hyperdynamic environment, a company needs to be ahead of others in sensing new opportunities and changing customer needs. This means nothing less than metamorphosing from a static lineup into a highly adaptable system. Transforming a company requires deep understanding of the systemic forces that are shaping business operations, as well as the organizational structures and culture dominating the business. Culture and organizational structures play a crucial role when it comes to changing the way a company conducts its business. They can either powerfully support or greatly limit how far any change initiative can go. Digital transformation, therefore, requires enabling companies to deliver on new customer expectations at a speed similar to their emergence. This, in turn, requires an organization that can exploit the ever-increasing market dynamic by adapting very fast, a capability that most organizations are struggling to develop. Companies have not been built with this main purpose in mind. Over the last hundred years, most of them have been built for efficiency and slow adaptation. High adaptation speeds are not possible as this would mean giving up efficiency or control. If both high speed of adaptation and high efficiency are required, then a fundamental change in organizational and management principles is needed. An update is required. Companies need to discover and learn how to organize their businesses and internal processes in a smarter way. Developing new flexible business practices in a gradual approach has proven to be a successful path for transformation efforts. This learning journey is the most important step and should not be skipped. It is crucial for succeeding in the transformation and establishing corporate learning. How does it look like? A transformation learning journey starts small with just a few teams. These teams focus on identifying what slows them down while responding or adapting to new market opportunities, and then trying to find ways to become faster. If they cannot self solve issues on their own, then they need to report to managers with the required authority to take effective action. This approach is highly effective in detecting structural barriers to change in the whole organization. With the right amount of management support, organizations can then learn to act on these barriers with adequate and right-sized transformation activities. These activities can grow. They can lead to removal of more and more barriers to change until the, the journey of learning and adaptation encompasses large portions of the company. Ultimately, the whole company will be involved, all organizational functions, all management levels. Let me give you an example. In 2015, Elon Musk from Tesla called Bosch and said, I want to buy some of your sensors and other components for my new electric car. Start of production is in six months. Tesla doesn't have specifications yet. I will now send a team of Tesla engineers from US to work together with you. My engineers will arrive in two days. Please make arrangements. By then, I expect you to have a project team of your own ready to co-engineer all technical details with them so that in six months, your components are ready to be delivered and integrated into Tesla cars at US plants. At that time, that was a radically new approach in the car industry. Bosch had to completely change all the processes very fast for this single project. Not only in engineering and manufacturing, but also in supporting processes in administration and management. In the end, Bosch finished the project in nine months, not in six, but that was still much faster than the standard time for delivery, more than 20 months. Bosch had done 
an incredible feat by breaking all the standard procedures, by focusing considerable, considerable efforts on this one project, by supporting the team from all sides and levels. Everybody cheered and was proud until, until other car makers started to ask, why can you suddenly deliver to Tesla in nine months, but not to us? Why do we still have to wait more than 20 months? Bosch was, of course, still very far away from delivering this, this kind of performance in other projects. In fact, a one-time limited success was created with a lot of effort and management attention. <coughs> to be clear, high-level management interventions cannot and should not be the norm. Task forces that run on emergency procedures cannot and should not be the norm. It would just eat away the profits. It would require pulling resources away from the main revenue streams. So Bosch had to learn to achieve this kind of cooperation and speed at bigger scales, and not only for one singular effort. Luckily, the Tesla project already uncovered many fields of action, as well as viable solutions for new challenges that were about to come become the norm. So taking the lessons learned in the Tesla project, Bosch reorganized some of its main engineering processes, making them faster and restructured some engineering solution teams to cooperate and jointly innovate faster. All these efforts had a clear business legitimation and the relevance and urgency of needed actions was acknowledged and supported across all involved parties and people. Change, therefore, found a fertile ground, an organization that was ready to learn and adapt to new ways of working. Transformation always requires learning. The purpose is on learning fast, removing emerging barriers one by one. In practice, this means starting small with a few teams. Learn fast, remove barriers rapidly change all processes and structures that are standing in the way of high adaptation speed. Next step is enabling organizational learning. The newfound practices need to rapidly find their way to all places in the organization where they add value. Then repeat. Now the organization is able to gradually develop routine and efficient management practices for quick and large scale adaptation. This institutionalized learning journey has proven to be a successful approach for transformation efforts. With the learnings from those pilot projects, companies quickly find their way to all relevant and affected parts of the business. Speed is of the essence. Actions need to be implemented in a timely manner. People need to see progress. They need to feel that their efforts make a difference. If change efforts take too long to take effect, they become perceived as just more bureaucratic initiatives. And organizational development and transformation start stalling. Speed of action is priority one. Priority two is the alignment of actions. In a transformation, all actions generate follow-up effects inside the organization. These effects can work against one another or reinforce one another. Therefore, the individual actions need to be aligned with overarching goals, communication narratives, and organizational stakeholders. The joint action model provides a framework to facilitate exactly this alignment challenge. In practice, it has proven to be a good way to start, plan, and continuously align transformation acti activities of companies along their transformation journey. Each field of action covers specific challenges of digital transformation and is connected to the others. Wherever your digital transformation starts, it will interfere with several of these action fields or require follow-up adaptation activities in order to support them. 
Let me give you some examples here. Silo-like, deeply nested organizational structures with a strong culture of bureaucracy and efficiency. Limit the available space for new innovative products or business models. Standardized digital processes can enable new business models like paper use. This business model type requires efficient real-time tracking and charging of microtransactions, leading to new demands of cross-domain skills in digital technology and business strategy, as well as flexible structures and reporting lines. Besides the interdependencies, the action fields also influence one another in multiple ways. Hurdles in one field of action can slow down progress in other fields, as well as success can drive progress elsewhere. But success in one field of action can also increase problems in other fields. That is why digital transformation needs to be seen holistically. To put it plainly, a transformation cannot be managed separately from other strategical efforts. Incremental improvements in a single action field won't deliver significant progress. The fields of actions are interdependent. They interact with one another in a complex and not exactly predictable way. No needs, opportunities, and dependencies will only emerge after the first steps into the journey are taken while transforming. The transformation will uncover many blind spots that the organization was unable to anticipate or adequately plan for. This is good. It is not a sign of bad preparation. It is a sign that people now take the effort seriously. Managers need to listen carefully for these bad news because they convey the real situation and people's aspiration. So surprises are inevitable and planning will never be perfect. We can now see how the iterative strategy of the learning journey helps us gradually learn and grow into the complex transformation challenge. Starting small with low risk, learn and grow with successes. Work on complex interlinked fields of action in an interdisciplinary way. Be open to recognize new interdependencies and interactions. How? Through an ongoing transparent dialogue. A continuous dialogue across all fields of action and across all management levels is the only way to uncover missing parts and to align activities across the action fields. When we look at companies that consequently applied these two principles, speed of action and alignment of actions, in their transformation, we can see that they achieved remarkable adaptation and innovation capabilities. But it is essential to go all the way in the transformation and not shying away from adaptations in all fields of actions particularly when it comes to adjustments in the action fields at the bottom right, that is structures and governance. In the final analysis, companies often do not dare to make comprehensive changes in this field. The need for adjustments in this action field is often a logical consequence of change in other action fields especially when following the principles of alignment of actions and speed of action. Change in this action field often has the biggest potential to really speed up the transformation process and to radically change the organization and influence all other action fields. Some of the leading 21st century companies like Amazon Web Services and Hire have achieved remarkable, high adaptive, innovative and profitable organizations by extending their transformation into this action field. So let's wrap up how digital transformation can succeed. Get your peers on the same page and achieve clarity about the impact of digital transformation on your company and its strategy. Make digitalization and transformation part of your strategy. 
So get rid of siloed strategy approaches. I can't say it often enough. You need a holistic strategy if you want to stay relevant in the future. A strategy that is unable to match a company's resources and capabilities to the capabilities of its environment is doomed to fail. Find a strategically important customer that urges you to work differently. Tackling new market opportunities or customer needs is always a good starting point as internal barriers are quickly become visible. Remove those internal barriers that sends a clear message of change. The more effective and rapid a guided change process is, the sooner new structures, processes, and organizational abilities become conceivable and implementable. Apply speed of action and alignment of actions to ensure these activities can grow and lead to removal of more and more barriers in the whole company. This allows you to take advantage of more and more new market opportunities. Over time, with more and more barriers being removed, taking advantage of new market opportunities is getting much easier. It is becoming the new normal. From my own industry experience and from working with various companies, I found only this strategy that permanently removes barriers in the transformation at speed and scale. And as I said, there is no shortcut. It requires bold moves and hard work, as this path is only made by walking. You will learn a lot. And keep in mind, how you do things determines what you can achieve in the end. The future belongs to those willing to embrace uncertainty and quickly adapt to new opportunities. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Yanka, for this uh, outstanding uh, presentation. Uh, there have been a lot of engagement, actually, uh, from participants. And uh, let, let, let's go to it uh, right away. Let's start mm -hmm. with uh, a very first question that we got uh, from uh, Veronica. And uh, Veronica was asking, really, if she, she got it right, based on the insight that you were providing. Uh, change management is a key piece to succeed, right? Yeah, it's, it's definitely. Um... Um, it's change management, but it's it's not change management on a smaller level. It's it's really rocking the foundations of a company. So it's a really big change. It's a metamorphosis. So a really really big change. And therefore, you can't just switch from state A to B. It's just all about learning. Wonderful, wonderful. And of course, uh, following on that one, there was Paul also who was asking, I think he was uh, uh, following up on one of the comments that you made. And the question goes is, if successful digital transformation requires loss of efficiency and or control, how do you stay profitable? So uh, I don't know if, as you were talking, you mentioned at some point that the digital transformation will require loss of efficiency and or control, oh, maybe. It uh, it depends on uh, most companies are um, are focusing on efficiency and control and are therefore not um, fast enough for change. And so their their procedures are way too slow. They are not the fast and furious one like startups. So they need to give up control. And during the change, of course, you will have some losses in efficiency. And that's the reason why you need to um, really speed up with the transformation and make sure that the learning cycles are not taking that long as you won't survive uh, running your business on, on a kind of dual operating uh, mode. Um, that takes too much resources away from you. Cool, excellent. And we have another question from James. Uh, James is asking, could you repeat the priorities for transformation? The um, Which priorities um, exactly? So um, first is um, start small. And then the, um, and then you are going to learn um, 
best case with uh, a business project um, coming with pressure coming from the outside. It's almost um, e very easy to to start doing things different. And when people see that you can do things different that, and that you can do different things of, too, then um, everything will, is starting to change. Then more and more um, things um, are getting imaginable and getting um, transferred into the daily doing. And therefore you change not only the processes over time, you also change the culture towards a more adaptive company um, with maybe with more distributed control, with um, different kinds of collaboration uh, that are then possible. Wonderful. But, and uh, but, and uh, but uh, nevertheless, you need to have a strategy. Strategy where you, where are you now? Where do you want? What do you want to achieve? What do you um, is your expectation? What you want to take from the opportunities of digitalization and interconnectivity as a company? So, and then you can start with your dominant business, and but keep in mind that there is also new businesses com uh, coming. And so you don't um, go deeper into the efficiency trap. That is, uh, yeah, my main advice. Thank you, Janka. And, uh, and uh, James, if you were actually referring to the challenges as opposed to the priorities, uh, in the, for the challenges, I think there were a few that uh, Janka listed, just in case this is what you meant. Uh, she was mentioning the business processes and the development yeah. of uh, internet as of things as a business model, restructuring of the organization, lack of openness, uh, general sc uh, scarcity of resources, uh, lack of communication between departments, and lack of IT professionals. Yeah. Yeah. If what you meant was uh, the challenges. Now let's move on, uh, Yanka. We got two questions that are kind of related. Uh, one from Elizabeth and one uh, from uh, Stephanie, but I'll combine mm -hmm. those. Uh, and it is still on the people side. Uh, how do you achieve transparent dialogue? And then uh, faced with a lot of resistance with staff to change, how do you be, or do you become profitable? Uh, so basically the people side, the transparent dialogue and the yeah. resistance uh, uh, from the staff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, transparent dialogue is often a culture problem in companies. So people, um, it would be a good good way to start with starting um, an open dialogue and giving people the purpose why you want to change things. Not because it's cool to take new technologies. It's because you want to stay relevant in the future. And um, then you can start and establish an open dialogue with the people. And with starting with small teams and then learning um, and uh, keeping people informed about the progress will also um, improve these open dialogues that you then started. And the second question was, can you just repeat it? It's about well, the face. Uh, faced with uh, resistance with staff, like uh, business are not uh, profitable. Uh, I mean, Stephanie yeah. elaborated even more. She talked about the uh, staff don't understand why it matters. Staff don't understand why values, behavior matters. Like uh, staff not, are not interested in improvement or no curiosity to learn. And then there is a lot of uh, roadblocks and overall culture not motivating. Uh, so need some tip uh, to, to align and interest staff for change. So yeah. basically, yeah. How do you overcome uh, that resistance? Um, you only overcome that resistance when you work on your culture. But the problem is you can't directly work on culture. It's not delegating a new culture to the communication department. It is not a stone you put in the middle of your company and say, this is our culture. It's a living thing. Culture is the result of um, what you see and what you feel during 
um, discussions within the company, how your boss behaves, how psych psychological safe you are in bringing bad news into a meeting. There are still companies where bad news or failures end careers. And then yeah, what do you want to do there? You need to work on those issues first. And yeah, then- Thank you so much. So, so you need to, to create this, um, this culture of um, that failures won't end your career and that you have room. Like maybe some of you know the, the Pixar uh, movie Ratatouille, where the critic at the, in the end said, Igo said, the new needs friends. And this is exactly what it is all about. If you want to try something new, you need friends, you need a safe space to explore and to learn. And as long as you don't have this in your company, then any change transform, any change initiative is doomed to fail. No, thank you so much. And it is quite insightful. You know, what you're saying really, Yanka, I mean, most people say it. They say, I mean, you need that uh, open culture. You need to be willing to accept bad news. You need to be willing to try, learn, fail, and so on. But most don't do. And that's yeah. why you, you were mentioning 70 to 95%. So really the gap is between saying and doing. What yeah. people say is not necessarily what people do. Let me go back to, uh, to you with one of the things that you were saying earlier. Of course, you were mentioning Bosch and you were mentioning uh, also uh, Tesla with Elon Musk. But I want to go to a question uh, mm -hmm. uh, related to, uh, on, on Elon Musk because we are in Germany. And of course, when we're in Germany, we talk about the car industry and so on. And, and, and he was commenting back in, in May 2022. And uh, he was saying, I think the company making the most progress uh, beside Tesla is actually Volkswagen, which is not a startup, but could be viewed in some ways as a startup from an electric vehicle standpoint. Tell me, like, because if we go back, I remember 2017, when you were looking at uh, Volkswagen and many some of the uh, German car manufacturer, the, the, there was some concern. How would they cope in this change? And then yet to hear Elon Musk saying, Volkswagen is doing well, at least in the electric car front. What happened? Yeah. Okay, so Volkswagen is um, Europe's largest car maker, uh, producing about 10 to 11 million cars per year. And 53% um, of the company is owned by Porsche and another 20% is held by the state of Lower Saxony where the headquarters is located, just to, to set the frame. Um, some years ago, and I think it was 2019, um, Volkswagen uh, started building the industrial cloud together with Amazon Web Services in order to transform its automotive manufacturing and logistics processes. So it used these IoT services to connect data from all machines, plants, and systems across the Volkswagen factory sites. And um, then they also asked suppliers to join the cloud to ensure that they get a seamless cross-company data transfer. So there, they are really um, hitting the stage. It's really a an, an, um, wonderful example how they did this uh, Industry 4.0 um, transformation kind. Digital. It's all about digitalization. Um, they are trying to do electric cars, but I wouldn't say they are um far ahead uh, or or just uh, standing out of the crowd from other german car makers also bmw and others are uh, are doing some some progress here um what is um um what you can see on the other hand is that the company is still moving very slow 
due to an excessive bureaucracy and a hierarchically um, management culture. And that really hinders them from um, speeding up their process. So they are, they are doing very well in their industrial cloud and all German car manufacturers are somehow at the same level when it comes to, to electric uh, cars. Yeah, let, let's take another question. Yeah. Good. We have many questions coming in and time is running, but let's take another question from uh, Elizabeth. And, and Elizabeth is saying, uh, do you recommend or not the notion of a dual operating system? No. And maybe, uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, okay. Um, not strictly, no, but- um, No, because um, what, what she meant really is run the business versus change the business. Uh, because yeah. of course you don't just shut down the company and do change, right? I mean- Right, yeah. So the, um, the topic was a dual operation system. Um, if you start transforming the companies, you start small with some teams and then you are adapting. And in this phase, you have a kind of dual operating system as you need to still produce your products and sell them to the customers. And you need the money getting from that to run your transformation. But um, a dual operating system um, in a permanent state. So if you think you can just run one part of the company in let's say an agile, a uh, style with autonomous teams, with decentralized um, um, decision-making and the other one in, um, in a strict hierarchy, um, that won't work. It just got it, got it. tears everything apart. Kind of the company won't survive it. Got it, because I, 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 I remember in 2017, actually, when we did the research with the economists, bright line research with the economists on Bridget the Gap, there was one section where we were interviewing back then the CSO, the chief strategy officer of uh, Volkswagen in that uh, research. And uh, the notion of ambidextrity was used, what was mm -hmm. called two speed. Because yeah. what they were saying, Yanka, was we cannot just say, okay, all of a sudden we're shutting down the combustion yeah. engine, which has been yeah. our bread and butter. But yeah. we were willing then, and I mean, in the response, they created what they call a two-speed approach, where they mm -hmm. had one spin-off, which was not spin-off completely outside the organization, but still connected to the organization, but that was focusing solely on mobility. How do mm -hmm. you move from point A to B? And yeah. what are the things that happen? So in that context, of course, uh, uh, there, there is that uh, uh, duality, if I can say, but as you nicely said, that duality cannot be there forever because yeah. sometimes the, the, the old need to go for the new to emerge. Otherwise, you get stuck in the past with the example that you mentioned. Uh, quite, quite, quite insightful there. Uh, another question from Veronica. And um, uh, she, she was asking if you could share uh, an example on how structure plays a key role when executing digital transformation. I suspect she meant organizational structures. Yeah. Yeah, um, um, when you're, um, when you have a very um, hierarchically organized company with many um, levels, then um, it is and an strictly concentrated on the dominant business with lots of bureaucracy, then it's really hard to, as, for example, for managers to uh, giving up control to, then it's also hard to, um, if you want to start with some pilot projects to do things differently, then there's also the, uh, always this battle for resources and money in the company. And usually the dominant business will win. And okay. the most uh, relevant um, part is uh, just think of a product, your main business and this successful product. And the longer you are successful with this one product, then 
everything in your company is going to be streamlined for doing business for this dominant business model. So this means all your processes are streamlined in order to run this one product. Your structure, your organization is designed and optimized to this one product. They are not able to do anything else. They can just uh, work for this cer certain dominant business. And when you then come and try moonshot innovation with all everything new, that won't that won't survive. Because Interesting. Every, everything is is optimized for the dominant business. And usually if you start with something new, whether the processes or the structures or anything else, the, the governance won't fit to the needs of the new business. And though, so there is, from the beginning, there will be a struggle between both sides for money, for yeah, for for um, management attention, uh, for resources, etc. Yeah, I, I mean this this is amazing, and we have even more questions than we can answer. And and I would even ask you about Chat uh, G GPT and what it meant. But we are we are running out of time here. Uh, I would like to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And I would like to thank all attendees who join us for this uh, rather really, really engaging session. You could look at the chat there. Lot of lot of interesting question. If you have a closing remark, uh, please free, uh, free, feel free, free uh, to share it, uh, Yanka. If you have a closing, a last minute word or final word, there. Yeah. If you have any uh, further questions, uh, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn. There is only one person with that name on LinkedIn, so you should find me. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Thank you all. And of course, as we see at uh, PMI Project Management Institute, uh, uh, within Brightline as well, uh, I mean, transformation is everywhere. So we yeah. want to have more successful transformations everywhere and have an impact on society as well, because that's what we're talking about uh, on people and society. So hopefully some of the learning that and the, the insight that Yanka shared today with us would be would prove useful for you in your day-to-day -day work or in the transformation that you, you're doing. Of course, I would love to see a scenario where actually we don't need to see a young Catholic yeah. talking to us about the failures, that we are actually more succeeding and that we are moving as a society. Thank you all. And uh, there'll be more transformation talk coming up. Our next one will be next month. Uh, we're hoping to, we'll have a host uh, next month in, in March. So please uh, do stay tuned for the next one. Uh, thank you all and have a great uh, rest of the day or good night, depending on where you are. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye.